Anyway, we're gonna get started on AI um, and academic integrity. Uh, I don't have all the answers, so, so I suppose this is just an opening to say, this is when we're gonna start the conversation and start to involve all of you. We want to try and make sure that everyone has a base level of information so that we can have that conversation. So today we're gonna go through, as I mentioned, some of the school guidelines. We're gonna show you one tool which is available to you, um, but just to start this conversation with you so we can start to deliver some training um, across our sessions. Uh, so last year, uh, Graham, Marie and myself did put out a video around uh, uh, January, uh, just looking at a framework so you can start to think about AI. It's pretty daunting. Um, I'll implore all of you to actually pay attention to AI, even if you're planning to leave the school next year, even if you're planning to retire, this is a technology which you're not gonna be able to ignore. So much like smartphones, internet banking, we wanna make sure that you have the knowledge that you need so you don't get scammed out of your MPF and have to come back to work, okay? So we wanna make sure that you, you know how to ask the right questions. So I've put this framework together to basically how, try and uh, allow you to think about where's the gaps in my knowledge and where can I um, move through this? So this is how I'm gonna to start to, to, to deliver this training for you all. Uh, so today we're going to give you an overview of uh, what generative AI is. I know a lot of you have heard about it in the news, but I wanna try and explain it in a, in a simple kind of term that hopefully you'll all understand. Um, we're gonna give you an idea of these general academic, uh, sorry, the academic integrity guidelines um, and also the generative AI guidelines. We're gonna show you these practical implications and then we're also going to offer some support. Okay. So what is generative AI? Um, a lot of you have heard about generative AI. Um, AI has been around for a while. Essentially, it's uh, deep learning, it's machine learning. And actually, as educators, you actually know a lot of the theory, but you don't realize. So the reinforced learning and the way that machines do it is actually based off B.F. Skinner. So a lot of the theory you've learned in university is being applied now to technology and the way that we build these models, which is pretty exciting. So it's designed off the human brain which is pretty cool. We know very little about the human brain, but we're trying to make these connections between how memories, how thoughts are processed. So to illustrate this, we're gonna play a little game. Uh, we often play this in community gatherings called Finish That Song. So we've got a little song. You guys, as our little AIs, are gonna finish this song for us. <laughs> He's getting up to sing. You just have to sing the last line. Excellent, excellent. So that's basically what all AI is doing. AI is predicting the end of your sentence. And we do this all the time, whether someone's holding something and you're wondering, are they gonna throw it at me? Are they gonna walk through this door? Should I hold it open for you? We're always making predictions with our brains. We're trying to finish each other's sentences. We're trying to finish the sum if it's on the board. We're always trying to make those predictions. And that's exactly what these models are doing. So simply, it's just maths, right? It's just predictions. And we know, we know there are limitations with maths as well. I know you guys call it math, but we tend to pluralize it. Um, with maths, it's always uh, a prediction, right? So we're always trying to find out what is that solution. And there's limitations with this. And when we look at these tools which are predicting if, it, if the student is plagiarizing with this material, it is still just a prediction. So if you put in one spelling error, it's gonna throw out that percentage. If you change one paragraph, it's gonna throw it out. So these tools are not very accurate. So it's a little bit of a losing battle for us to say definitively if a student is cheating or if a student is not. Now, when you're using these tools, we also need to think about this when we're, when we're developing them because you can quite easily fool the model. You can quite easily lead it down a certain path to give it an answer which you want. And what this is called is chain of thought prompting. So I've got another little exercise for you here. Uh, we're basically going to, to model through this chain of thought prompting. So my first question is, what is the name of our new math teacher? And you've got a face there to jog your memory. Tegan. It is Tegan. <laughs> what do you call someone who does not consume animal products? <laughs> Vegan, that's right. <laughs> yeah. And the last prompt is, what is the name of our new attendance officer? 
Yes, that's right. But for some reasons, Americans like to deviate from this and then say, Megan. And of course, Megan is a different person. <laughs> so what leads us to this? What leads us to have a nice structured language? Tegan, vegan, Megan. We can see the, how, they're, how, they're, how they're written, right? What leads us to go in this different direction? And it could be, in fact, that we have incorrect data. <laughs> Despite his long hair, or did have long hair, Rob is not a vegan. <laughs> Rob is not a vegan. So it could be this incorrect data, or it could be the bias in the data which is actually um, causing these issues. And this is a huge problem in, in AI research at the moment, it's alignment. How do we come from this data, give it a prompt, and end up where we want it to be? So this is a huge issue. We know we've heard these terms called um, hallucinations and things like that. The chief scientist for OpenAI says they're going to have the stats sold within 12 months. So a lot of the limitations that you're seeing in these models, when you say AI can't be creative, AI can't do this, they're aware of that and it will soon. So I want to give you guys a bit of urgency in this that this is something we need to recognize, something we need to address. I've been pushing the school for a while to get up here and talk to you about it. I've been very excited about it. If you ever came in and spoke with Scott Williams and I before, we were constantly talking about this. But as we're starting to use these tools, we need to think of this as we're starting to, to put in our prompts. We need to get our, our AI to reflect in the same way that we would with our students. We need to make sure that as we're prompting it, we give it examples of what we want. So here, a lot of people, when they first use AI tools, that they'll put in a prompt and they'll say, well, it didn't give me what I want and then we'll just shut it down, okay? Or I asked it for um, a simple math sum and it screwed it up, okay? These are trying to give you the answer that it thinks you want. So it's a bit like if you were on Jeopardy and you were, had to give an answer within the next three seconds, right? And they, they said, what's the capital of Peru? What's the capital of Australia? What's the capital of West Australia? And you had to give an answer, you're going to make a mistake, right? And sometimes you do this in your class as well. I know teachers sometimes uh, make faux pas or make up certain things if, if they don't know the answer. Uh, if you don't know the school rule, you could just say what you think might be best. So we need to make sure that as we're using these tools, we're also reflecting the same way that we, we would with a student. Get them to step out their answers. Get them to revise their answers. And some of these tools now do connect to the internet. So whilst the models are trained on a body of information and whilst they, they are contained, they do now access the internet to fact check themselves. And they're also using AI models to train other AI models so it can reflect within itself a bit of inception going on. But definitely prompt engineering is part of what we're needing to train ourselves and our students on. Whereas we, were, we used to train them, don't put a question in Google, and we tried to get them to use good keywords. Well, now we're trying to get them to go back to answering a question, which is putting in a query or a prompt. But there are certain ways that they need to learn how to do it, and we need to learn how to do it to make the AI give us what we want. Exactly. It's almost going back to those skills we, we used in Google. We're now applying this to AI. So how do we form a good question? How do we identify the correct information? We're all digital literacy skills that we've been harping on about since the start of the 21st century. So we do need to be mindful of hallucinations. We do need to be mindful of bias within data and bias in the, in the results, and even the bias in your prompts as well, because you can lead something down a garden path. And last of all, we do need to think about the terms of use. So as you're using uh, different tools within the school, uh, our recommendation is to use the big players, right? People who have something to lose. There's a lot of people who can develop tools. Uh, students in Graham's classes are, are building AI tools. They're building their own neural networks. That's something we teach as a part of the computer science program. But you wouldn't put your data in the hands of Derek Zhang. Derek Hart. You wouldn't put your, maybe Christine Lamb, but maybe not Derek. So you've got to think about who, who are these developers? Do they have something to lose? Because it's very easy to develop these tools with the frameworks that are in place. But we need to make sure that our data is secure and our students' data is secure. So try and stick to the big players. If you want to experiment with uh, a chatbot, I'd recommend installing the Edge browser. It has the Bing chat that uses GPT-4. And you see this nice thing when you log in, it says protected and your personal and company data is protected in this chat. So that's because we're a part of Microsoft. We have Microsoft licensing that allows us to secure our data, okay? So if you want to start playing, that's a good tool for you to start to play with. There's also an issue of equity as well with students allowing access to these tools. 
If you're starting to recommend that students use ChatGPT, they need a VPN to access it. They need to pay in order to get a certain level. Okay, so we want to try and have equity for all students, make sure everyone has access to the same tools. So if you are recommending it within your classroom, if you are using it for activities, this is a good, good tool for you to start with. Yeah, and this is where Graham, last year when he was teaching his uh, computer science class, he had Daniel and Jeff Sieverd and, and I on a panel talking about the ethics. Is there something you wanted to add about that, Graham? <laughs> uh, so because the ethics of that are definitely something to consider about the potential bias uh, that is baked into the uh, large language models, the what they are learning from is they're learning from what has been published in the past. That is not representative of all people and all voices by any effect. So um, it's something to be mindful of. Uh, a quick question about being chat enterprise. I know it says enterprise. Does that mean we get a slideable out version of GBC for in that you have to basically log in and that might reset to get home? Yeah, so education tends to get uh, new releases or new features ahead of other industries because we're a test bed. Um, and as much as we don't think it, uh, it's not as vital as, say, medicine or pilots or, you know, airlines. So we do often get new features ahead of time. So, yes, we do get new features with our education license. I question then follow up with, do students get access to Big Giant? They do. Yes, I believe that's all been turned on now. Daniel, do you repeat whatever was just said? All in here. Uh, so Graham was just asking, uh, do the students have access to Bing Chat? Yes, they do. Um, and do we get any special features or anything because we have enterprise licensing with Microsoft? And the answer was yes to that also. And is Bing Chat still on the internet? Uh, Bing Chat has an iOS app, has a Mac OS app, and is in the Edge chat. So you can install on And they soon are planning to extend it to other browsers, but right now it's yeah. only an edge. Yeah, I believe there's a, a Chrome plugin coming out. So. Coming. Help. So as we started to look at our policy documents, there were, there were a couple of major conferences which sort of guided our, our direction. There was a UNESCO conference, which looked at industry and the impact of generative AI on industry. And then there was the Beijing consensus on education and AI. Um, and out of that, they, they came up with these, these skills which shouldn't seem unfamiliar to you apart from AI literacy, but we could transfer that to, to digital literacy, critical thinking, problem solving, creativity. And these are things which aren't unfamiliar. They're terms we've heard before. And actually, some of these are embedded into our strategic plan already. So they're embedded into our CCRs. So these are things which we should already be doing within our classroom, already within our courses. So we can tick that box. So as we enter this new era where generative AI is starting to pop up everywhere, it used to be that when we were uh, putting something in Google or typing in our email, we got the next word suggested to us or maybe the next phrase suggested to us. But now we actually have Grammarly Go, which will Jack will fashion the entire reply email to somebody, for example. And this is a new era when we think about plagiarism, when we think about writing. Hybrid writing will become the new norm. This is the work of a professor, um, Sarah Eaton, out of the University of Calgary's School of Education. And she talks about a, a post-plagiarism era, at the point being that historical definitions of plagiarism will no longer apply because hybrid writing will be so ingrained that we won't necessarily um, have a right line between what is ours and what is suggested to us and we take quickly. For our students, that line is blurred already. For us, it's a little clearer, but as AI is incorporated into our tools, it's gonna get blurrier and blurrier. So this is why her point number one is attribution, meaning citing, remains important to try to admit that something isn't all yours, to be willing to cite and say where it's coming from. An advantage, number two, is that language barriers are going to disappear largely with generative AI as the tools quickly enable us to move between different languages all around the world and is really facilitating uh, for second language learners, third language learners, to be able to communicate fluently in, in another language. Uh, will it lessen human creativity? 
she believes no, um, that, that it's an opportunity for us to be um, exposed to more things, have interesting, quirky things juxtaposed for us, and humans will always be incredibly creative. Number five is quite interesting. Humans can relinquish control, but not responsibility. This is about the responsibility of authorship. So the scientific, the scholarly community has been struggling a lot with authorship as uh, academic writers have started to use ChatGPT to generate journal articles and call them as co-authors as they submit their academic papers for peer-reviewed publication. And the publications have been struggling to figure out how do we handle this concept of authorship? Is ChatGPT an author of this paper? And the consensus in the community seems to be coming down to the fact that when you say you're the author of something, you take full responsibility for the content that's there. So in a research project, for example, you are vouching for your methods, the way that you selected your sample, the way that the research was conducted. And generative AI cannot do that. It cannot take responsibility for those things. You cannot sue it in court if it says something that's false. Right, And um, this is where there was a case in May where uh, some personal injury lawyers were fined 5,000 US dollars because they went to court and cited ChatGPT, which gave them fake case studies, case law, that they cited in support of their client. Well, they, they use the excuse, well, I didn't know that ChatGPT wasn't just a really great search engine, but it was, it was truly egregious because they were taking the um, generative AI bot answer and which was hallucinated and putting it, in, in, putting it up in front of a judge in court as evidence and those cases didn't really exist. So there is a, a real responsibility for us to take ownership and responsibility when we author something. Now, I think it's also difficult, especially with academic writing, because often you would go to the references in order to find where the author had find that, found those sources. But even with, with these models, if we had the exact prompt and the exact tool and we put it in, you wouldn't always get the same response. So you couldn't replicate the experiment, you couldn't replicate that knowledge base. So that's why it becomes more difficult to, to cite this effectively as well. Mm -hmm. So our school has been wrestling with this. We had a group that came together um, with the leadership of all, uh, all the divisions and our curriculum leader, and we were talking about what our policy should be. And this is, um, we have adopted an AI policy for our school. It is hyperlinked in the syllabus that you guys have given to students. And we want to cover a few of the things that are inherent there um, because we feel like it's really important that we as a community, we have decided that we are embracing this technology. We are not banning it and preventing it. And we are going to collaborate with the kids on this, but we also have a responsibility when we are setting assignments that we set very clear parameters for them so they know what they may do and what they might not do. At this point, um, there may be a lot of students who are using the technology and feeling really guilty about it because they think it might cross a line, but they don't really know, but their teacher didn't really tell them that they couldn't use it, so they're gonna use it. And so that was happening last semester. So we also have an academic integrity policy. And in that policy, we do say that students have the responsibility to talk to their teachers about anything that they feel, anything they have questions about and that teachers have the responsibility to be super clear about what their expectations are for students. And this is where we're hoping to help you guys put in place really clear guidelines for the kids so that they know what's allowed and not allowed in your class, in your context. So this is borrowed from uh, the International School in Bangkok. They have a traffic light um, graphic that they use for students. So we'll provide these slides. If this looks like it's useful to you, feel free to steal it. But the idea is that 
in some cases, AI is not acceptable. On some assignments, it might not be acceptable to be used. In some cases, it may cautiously be used. And in some cases, it's green-lighted and it's absolutely fine, depending on that, what that assignment is asking you for and what skills need to be measured. So a red light scenario is where, uh, how did you use the AI tool, kids? Well, it gave me the answer. It gave me a block of text or a complete written piece. And this is typically for most of us a red light because it's taking over, it's letting the thinking be co-opted by the AI. And in that case, we want to talk to the kids about um, using it as just a stepping stone to building their own work and thinking critically about what the AI has given them and to confirm their own understanding. They need to cautiously move forward if they have uh, used it maybe to generate a structure, outline, list of keywords, deeper questions, or ideas for them to use in their own work. For some of you, that might be an acceptable use of AI. It's kind of a brainstorming or organizational tool for them in constructing text or constructing an image or project. Um, but here, we need to teach them how to cite it. Right? We need to show them how to give some attribution so that you know when they asked the AI and what was generated by the AI so that you know where those um, boundaries are. And then if they got an answer from AI but they've done their lateral reading and verified it, if they've gotten a block, so block of text and they verified with their teacher that they may use it and they know how to cite it, or that AI has generated a structure, outline, list of keywords, deeper questions, or ideas for them to use in their work, then they might get the green light to go ahead and use it as long as they cite it properly. As a shorter um, table, we put this together as a possible, another one that you might steal a slide to present to students or put in your syllabus of things that might be acceptable for them to use AI for, such as brainstorming, being a personal tutor. AI can do that quite nicely. Doing preliminary research, generating practice quizzes or flashcards, summarizing long bodies of text. This is actually a really great use of AI if they're reading something really complicated. So for that one, we actually put a, a yellow light on it because if the task is to summarize a piece of text, <laughs> then they may not be successful. It's so true. And actually today, um, Betsy and I have an annotated bibliography assignment for our advanced AP research class. And I put it into Bing chat to uh, give me an annotation. And we looked at that to see what that looks like. And then we plugged on the rubric that we're grading the kids on, scoring the kids on into being chat and said, okay, make it ex uh, exceeding according to this uh, rubric. And it does a really good job. No, it does a really good job. So uh, I think the biggest thing on this table is, is the asterisks at the bottom. So when allowed by the teacher, so you still have the power to say, for this activity, you can use it. For this one, you, you don't need to use it. So how, you still have that freedom. You still have that power to design your assessments in your classroom. Absolutely. And those of you who are um, in language acquisition, if you're in the global languages department, it's completely OK to tell those kids, no, they may not use those uh, translation tools or use those tools to write for them. Uh, so we this is something that into that. Of course, uh, I would really appreciate that that light would be all on the task sheet. And it makes it much easier for me when I'm following up with kids with there is an academic integrity concern. And they say the teacher didn't tell me that it wanted to be, and he said, she said, mm -hmm. it's right here. And I'll leave it right here and trap him like in a chair. There's no way you could have missed that. So that would be helpful for me as well. And it's an attitude with the young. So we do have some tools to support you in what we're calling essentially the work verification process. Um, hopefully, you are already redesigning your assessments so that you are aware of how generative AI would, have, would complete that assessment for you. Uh, we have some tools that can help you if you haven't done that. Um, along with that, we highly recommend 
you need to make sure that you turn on version history for your Google Docs. So in order for this, for you to be able to see the version history of Google Docs, the students need to share editing rights of the document. So when they submit it through Schoology, it may not have editing rights, they'll need to actually share that with you. Okay, and then from there, you can click through and see where they've copy and pasted blocks of text, how they're working through the process for that assessment. And hopefully as you're working with your students, you're allowing a little bit more time to be able to have conversations with your kids about, about their thinking and about the product that they're turning into you. Because otherwise they might turn in a product that they can't speak to on, a, uh, on an intellectual level. They can't tell you what they were thinking when they wrote it and how, what this word means and how this is uh, being used. So having those milestones along the way, those kind of checkpoints where you're checking in with them about the process of their work can be really helpful so that you don't end up with a um, product that is AI generated. I also want to mention that uh, Maureen, who's a middle school librarian, she's in the back if you guys know Maureen. Maureen and I will be doing a session on Noodle Tools and Grammarly Go coming forward. Uh, Noodle Tools is a bibliography building software. So if you have a big project that students are doing research over a period of time and they have many sources, Noodle Tools now has a way to cite generative AI and I'll show you a couple screenshots. And we also have moved away from what was our plagiarism software detection? Unicheck. We have moved away from Unicheck and back to Turnitin. We have it uh, installed so that it works with Schoology. So if you want to use it as a formative check, as a tool for the kids to be able to see uh, whether their work has a lot of matches or whether their work sounds like it's AI generated, through the month of December, we have free AI generation uh, checker with our Turnitin subscription. Beyond that, we will see. Right now, those, plagiar those AI um, checkers are heavy and kind of poor. They're not very reliable. They are one tool in your toolkit, but I would not make the, the thing that you rely on to determine whether a student has generated something with AI or not because they are notoriously poor. So we're, we have it free with our so we're happy to December to try it out. On, on the student life to tell all the kids that we have AI plagiarism checking. So we can do that post for you. It's like putting that sign on your house that says guarded by security system. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> even if you don't have one. <laughs> so this, if you were in Noodle Tools, which is this bibliography building software that we all have a subscription to, and honestly, which all of your kids already are using because they start with it in sixth grade and they bring it into the high school. Uh, it now has uh, help for how to create a citation to say that you have used generative AI. So this is an example. The citation will include the prompt or query that the student put into the chatbot so that you know when they asked and then it says the source of that and the date. We also have some sources that we are compiling. They're on the library homepage. Uh, you'll see the one that says, uh, it's really tiny here, but it says generative AI guidance for teachers. And within that collection, there are a number of tools that might be useful to you. And there's an additional link to uh, looking for academic honesty. It has our AI policy, our academic honesty policy. It has information about uh, using noodle tools, which allows transparency into the system so you can see as the, as the students are, are citing sources and uh, a lot more things in there. If you come across a resource that you really think would be great to share with everybody, please tell me and I will add it into this collection. All right, so now we're gonna have a little play with a tool. Um, so everyone doesn't need to have a laptop, you can do one between two. Um, I have recorded this as a separate tutorial as well. So if it goes a little bit quick or it's not working on your machine because of the Wi-Fi or something, don't worry, don't worry, you won't miss out. 
So as I mentioned before, I know some of you have already started playing with ChatGPT and chatbots and all those sort of things. We're just trying to give everybody a base level of knowledge so that we can start to have a conversation about these tools. We're gonna be using Canva today. Uh, so whether you knew it or not, Canva has actually integrated some AI tools into their uh, product. Uh, the AI writing is not available for students, but it is available for teachers, which is pretty interesting. Uh, so the first thing we're gonna do is to log into Canva. So if you go to canva.com, log in with your school Google account. And then we're gonna create a document. I'm actually gonna do this live. I shouldn't do this, but I'll do it anyway. All right, so once you log in, we're gonna click on doc. It should be on the left underneath the main banner. And that's with the caution games, why can you share for a dummy up? Wow, tell me we're still typing in camera.com, I'll slow down. The other tool I'm going to show you is available to everyone. So Magic Write is only for certain education uh, users, which is why it's an issue. But we do have image generation, which would be good fun. So perhaps on my lesson plan, I want to have a nice picture. I go to apps. If you scroll down on your apps, there'll be one that looks like this. It says text to image. And then from here, you can put in a prompt. Now, if you try and get a prompt, which is photorealistic, the faces look a little weird. So unless you're doing some sort of dystopian English unit, it might not be great. Try and use different styles. So be descriptive with your prompt, something like in a style of anime or cartoon or something like that. If you want to try and break it, make sure your prompt says, I want a picture of a happy math teacher. show you one more thing. Once you have your lesson plan, if you press this convert button at the top, it'll then turn your lesson plan into a PowerPoint presentation. Opportunities, and it's not just for the students. I know we, we hung a lot on, um, on students and academic integrity, but there's lots of ways that you can improve your efficiency as well. For example, writing college recommendation letters, uh, but also helping support with marking and feedback developing uh, curriculum documents, uh, uh, things like that. Uh, you can use it as a face level to then get your thoughts going. So hopefully we'll stop some of those blank moments where you're trying to think of a different verb. Uh, hopefully that'll work a little bit better. Uh, we're gonna try and pull everything into these individual buckets, as I mentioned. So when I advertise different uh, uh, offerings for professional learning, I'm gonna try and put them under these buckets so you can kind of understand what you're trying to focus on. Are you trying to understand the underlying technology, you're trying to use it, are you looking at how we're gonna integrate it, are you looking at academic integrity and that kind of integration. And last of all, oh, I didn't know I had an animation on that one. We have some sessions on, on offer. So we're gonna offer the same session in middle school and high school, uh, lunchtime in the middle school, because apparently they don't like to stay after school, and then after school in the high school. They're gonna be short, sharp sessions so the first one Josh Wood and I are gonna offer is introduction to Bing Chat. Maureen and Marie are gonna offer one on Noodle Tools and Grammarly Go. Okay, so that's your first opportunity. Again, I'll try and record these because I know everyone can't make it at lunchtime or after school. So we'll try and record these as well and give multiple opportunities. Okay. And as your exit ticket today, we actually do want to survey you a little bit about what your thoughts are on AI, how you're using it, how your students are using it, and what might be supportive for you going forward for the coaching team to offer. So if you scan this URL, it will take you to a survey. Uh, thank you so much for spending the time with us today. We will, we will, God. Okay.